Uh, my name is David Morgan. I'm the pastor at Bear Swamp Baptist Church, and uh, we are doing daily scripture readings until the end of the year, and uh, we'll see what happens after that. Uh, but what what kind of plan are we using? Well, we're using the five day Bible reading program. You don't have to use that pro that plan, but I encourage you to have a plan because if you don't have a plan, you cannot work the plan. Uh, let's go ahead and pray and begin our reading for today. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for expressing uh, the majesty of knowing you to us through your creation, through our conscience, and through your consecrated word. May we not only learn something this morning, but grow. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's take a look at what our reading is going to be. It's going to be coming from Ezekiel chapters 7 through 9. Some of my favorite chapters in the book of Ezekiel, uh, chapter 8 is possibly my favorite chapter. You'll see why in a minute. It's very interesting. So uh, let's go into our reading. By the way, if you have any prayer requests, drop them in the comments, comment box. Uh, we have prayer meeting tonight at the church, and uh, I'll try to remember to bring it before the body, okay? Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 7. The word of the Lord came to me. Uh, today we're reading from the English Standard Version. And you, O son of man, thus says the Lord Yahweh to the land of Israel, an end, the end has come upon the four corners of the land. Now the end is upon you. And I will send my anger upon you. I will judge you according to your ways. See, this is what everybody deserves. I will judge you according to your ways. What we need is grace. What we need is good news. Of course, that good news comes in the form of Jesus died for you. I will judge you according to your ways, and I will punish you for all your abominations. Uh, tuck that word away. We'll come back to it in a minute. And my eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity, but I will punish you for your ways, while your abominations are in your midst. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, disaster after disaster. Behold, it comes. Remember yesterday, Ezekiel gave them that uh, that object lesson concerning the city. If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and read chapters 4 through 6, especially, I think it's chapter 4. And you'll see what I'm talking about. An end has come. The end has come. It has awakened against you. Behold, it comes. Your doom has come to you, O inhabitant of the land. The time has come. The day is near. A day of tumult, not of joyful shouting on the mountains. Now I will soon pour out my wrath upon you and spend my anger against you and judge you according to your ways. There's that phrase again. And I will punish you for all your abominations. And my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will punish you according to your ways, while your abominations are in your midst. Then you will know that I am the Lord who strikes. This is not a popular message today, but it's still true. Behold the day. Behold, it comes. Your doom has come. The rod has blossomed. Pride has budded. Violence has grown up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor their abundance, nor their wealth. Neither shall there be preeminence among them. The time has come. The day has arrived. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn, for wrath is upon all their multitude. For the seller shall not return to what he has sold while they live. For the vision concerns all their multitude. He shall not turn back, and because of his iniquity, none can maintain his life. They have blown the trumpet and made everything ready, but none goes to battle. For my wrath is upon all their multitude. The sword is without, meaning outside the city. Pestilence and famine are within, inside the city. He who is in the field dies by the sword, and him who is in the city, famine and pestilence devour. These are the, the same three uh, judgments that he's been talking about in the last uh, three chapters. And if any survivors escape, they will be on the mountains, like doves of the valleys, all of them moaning 
each one over his iniquity. All hands are feeble, and all knees turn to water. They put on sackcloth, and horror covers them. Shame is on all faces, and baldness on all their heads. They cast their silver into the streets, and their gold is like an unclean thing. Their silver and gold are not able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They cannot satisfy their hunger or fill their stomachs with it. For it was the stumbling block of their iniquity. There it is again. His beautiful ornament they used for pride, and they made their abominable images and their detestable things of it. Therefore, I make it an unclean thing to them, and I will give it into the hands of foreigners for prey, and to the wicked of the earth for a spoil. And they shall profane it. I will turn my face from them, and they shall profane my treasured place. He's talking here about the temple. And, of course, as you well know, they had profaned the temple many times, particularly Manasseh, who brought in the detestable images, the abominable images, the idols, and put them in the holy place. Robbers shall enter and profane it. Forge a chain, for the land is full of bloody crimes, and the city is full of violence. I will bring the worst of the nations to take possession of their houses. I will put an end to the pride of the strong and their holy places shall be profaned. When anguish comes, they will seek peace, but there shall be none. Disaster comes upon disaster. Rumor follows rumor. They seek a vision from the prophet, while the law perishes from the priest and counsel from the elders. The king mourns. The prince is wrapped in despair, and the hands of the people of the land are paralyzed by terror. According to their way, I will do to them, and according to their judgments, I will judge them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Remember yesterday we said we're going to see that phrase over and over again. They shall know that I am the Lord. Chapter 8. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, the hand of the Lord God fell upon me there. So he he falls into a trance in his house in the presence of the elders. They must have been having a meeting about something. Then I looked, and behold, a form that had the appearance of a man. Below what appeared to be his waist was fire, and above his waist was something like the appearance of brightness, like gleaming metal. This is the second time that he has seen this individual. I believe... Uh, let's see. I believe he saw this person in chapter 2 or 3. Maybe chapter 1. Let's take a look at it real quick. It's chapter 1, verse 26. Above the expanse over their heads was the likeness of a throne in appearance like sapphire, and seated upon the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And he looks the same way as this person. So this is this is a in vision form. This is not what necessarily God actually looks like, but in vision form, he's seeing God. Verse 3, He put out the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my head, Yikes! <laughs> Grabbed me by the hair. And the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem to the entrance of the gateway of the inner court that faces north. So where is he? He's in Jerusalem. To, to Just inside the gate that faces the inner court from the north where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provokes to jealousy. Now there's a lot of, uh, you know, we don't know exactly what this image of jealousy is, but um, probably some kind of an idol. And that's, that's really all we know. Verse 4. By the way, when it says, which provokes to jealousy, who's getting jealous? Well, it's, the, it's God. It's God himself. He says, I am a jealous God. Verse 4. And behold... The glory of the God of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw in the valley. Do you remember that? Remember that vision that he saw with the wheels and the and the beings and the. That's what he saw 
in the valley, he says. Then he said to me, Son of man, lift up your eyes now toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes toward the north, and behold, <clears throat> north of the altar gate in the entrance was this image of jealousy. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel are committing here to drive me far from my sanctuary, which you will see still greater abominations. And he brought me to the entrance of the court. So now uh, the temple has a court area, kind of like a courtyard. So now he's at the entrance of that area. And when I looked, behold, there was a hole in the wall. Then he said to me, Son of man, dig in the wall. So I dug in the wall, and behold, there was an entrance. And he said to me, Go in and see the vile abominations that they are committing here. So I went in and saw, and there engraved on the wall all around was every form of creeping things and loathsome beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel. Before them stood seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel, with Jezaniah the son of Shaphan standing among them. Each had his censer in his hand, and the smoke of the cloud of incense went up. Um, so, Jezaniah, we don't know exactly who he was, but this would have been surprising to Ezekiel. <laughs> Let's just say that. This would be like if the Lord showed a, uh, show, you know, showed somebody a vision of one of the elders of our church or one of the deacons doing something horrible, or, or me doing something horrible. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark? each in his room of pictures. For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. He said also to me, you will see still greater abominations than they commit. What, what were the abominations they were committing? Well, they had idols and pictures of idols in the temple courtyard, in the temple itself. Verse 14, Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord. And behold, there sat women, weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was a false god. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? You will see still greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court. So he went from the gate of Jerusalem to the courtyard of the temple to inside the court of the temple to now the inner court of the house of the Lord. And behold, at the entrance of of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, worshiping the sun toward the east. The sun rises in the east, so this would have been at sunrise. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations that they commit here? that they should fill the land with violence and provoke me still further to anger. Behold, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, I will act in wrath. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. The purpose of this vision, I think, was twofold. Good morning, Miss Ann Spivey. Twofold. Number one, to show Ezekiel that the judgment that's coming on the people of Israel is has been earned. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, and they're going to collect their wages. Uh, even though this was a vision, I believe it communicated what was actually happening in the city and in the temple. Um, so let's see what happens in verse in chapter nine. Then he cried in my ears with a loud voice, "Who's the he? This this person." Uh, that he had seen sitting on the throne in chapter 1, saying, Bring near the executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, uh, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his weapon for slaughter in his hand. And with them was a man clothed in linen, with a writing case at his waist. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. This is still in the vision, by the way. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the threshold of the house. Uh, as you know, 
the cherub is a reference to the inner, holy of holies, the, 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 the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was and where the, the twin, uh, I almost said eagles, the twin angels stood with their wings touching from one wall to the next wall over here, from one wall to the next. Uh, and in the middle was the Ark of the Covenant and there was two cherubs right there. And the glory of the God of Israel would meet with the high priest there. And this says the glory of the Lord of, uh, of the God of Israel had gone up and had gone to the threshold of the house, that is, of the temple, of the house of the Lord. So he's, he's leaving, in other words. This is not good. And he called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing case at his waist. And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. And to the others he said in my hearing, Pass through the city after him, and strike. Your eye shall not spare, and you shall show no pity. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one on whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Now the book of Revelation, there's a reason that many people read the book of Ezekiel and the book of Revelation together. Um, there's some similar imagery. And there's that imagery in the book of Revelation where God says, put a mark on the faithful and, uh, you know, they're going to be protected. Uh, middle of verse 6, he says, begin at my sanctuary. That's an interesting phrase too. I think it's Peter that says um, that judgment will begin at the house of God. Uh, I think that's still true today. So they began with the elders who were before the house. Then he said to them, defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. So they went out and struck in the city. And while they were striking and I was left alone, I fell upon my face and cried, Ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in the outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, uh, The guilt of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of blood and the city full of injustice. That's another way of saying that they were very violent people. And injustice is a way of saying they were oppressing the poor. Uh, in fact, they were probably killing the poor, um, starving the poor. For they say, the Lord has forsaken the land, and the Lord does not see. As for me, my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will bring their deeds upon their heads. And behold, the man clothed in linen with the writing case at his waist brought back word saying, I have done as you commanded me. So, and you can see when we get to chapter 10 tomorrow, the glory of the Lord is going to leave the temple. And this, this vision of the glory of God leaving is going to continue until he leaves Jerusalem altogether. It's very sad. And uh, the good news is he comes back. God never leaves us without good news. But he does want us to know the truth. And the truth is, if we continue in sin, um, his presence, I'm not, if you're a Christian, his presence doesn't leave us. But his blessing will leave us. I promise you that. All right, John chapter 3. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Y'all know this story. A ruler of the Jews. This means a religious ruler. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. First of all, he came by night. Why did he do that? Well, people uh, speculate, but he probably didn't want to be seen. Why? Because uh, usually when they sent Pharisees um, to Jesus, it was to trap him in his, in his words. But he seems to be genuinely curious, uh, convicted. So G Jesus answered him in verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He totally did not understand. 
this new birth. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Um, you know, p people disagree on what this is a reference to. Is, is the born of water a reference to physical birth? Um, you know, when a woman is about to have a baby, her water breaks. Uh, and then the second one would be, of course, salvation, uh, spiritual regeneration. But I think... This is just me talking. I think that the of water is a reference to baptism. I am not saying that you have to be baptized to be saved, but I mean baptism is closely associated with salvation in the New Testament. G Peter, for example, says in I think it's Acts chapter two, Rep repent and be baptized, and you will be saved. And even though we don't take that to mean you have to be baptized in order to be saved, it is abundantly clear throughout the New Testament that everywhere people are being saved, they are also being baptized. So I think that's what this is a reference to, especially considering the context. We had just gotten done talking about John the Baptist in the last chapter, uh, or maybe two chapters before. And... Uh, so, I, and of course, that's what he's doing. By the way, um, I said I was going to give you an answer as to the question, how, when, when we look at John chapter 1, it seems like Jesus' baptism is immediately followed by his miracle at the wedding of Cana, which doesn't make sense because we know from Matthew, Mark, and Luke that immediately after his baptism, he went into the desert, the wilderness, to be tempted by Satan. And so... The answer that I came up with, I did a little study on my own, and then I reached out to a pastor friend of mine that I have a lot of respect for, and uh, I came to this conclusion. When John the Baptist is having this conversation with the Pharisees in verses 19 through 28, and then in verse 29, it says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, um, my misunderstanding was that it was in verses 29 to 34 that Jesus is baptized. But I believe that's a misunderstanding. I believe Jesus was baptized sometime before verse 19. The baptism is not explicitly mentioned. That much we know for sure. And so what happens is he's, bat he's baptized sometime before verse 19 then we have this conversation between John the Baptist and the Pharisees, and then Jesus is back from his trial in the wilderness, and it says the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him. This is after his temptation in the wilderness, and uh, so that makes total sense and also takes care of the seeming contradiction. Now, let's get back to Jesus' explanation of the new birth. Verse 5, once again, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. In other words, um, when I look out my window on a windy day, I can see that it's windy, but I cannot tell you uh, where the wind is going to go, when it's going to die down, when it's going to pick up. Um, the same thing is true, he says, of God's Spirit. The work of the new birth, the work of regeneration, the work of salvation is up to the Spirit of God. Yes, we must exercise faith, but we don't know when he's going to act. This has been my whole point in my evangelism series on Sunday mornings. We are to sow the seed. We are to proclaim the gospel. We are to tell people about Jesus, about their own sin, about their about the, the coming wrath of God. And then the, the Holy Spirit will move when he wants to. He says, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. This is a spiritual birth. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? <laughs> it was a totally foreign concept to him. Verse 10, Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Uh, verse 14 is another indication that Jesus was in complete control, knew his future, knew his fate. Um, as you know the story of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness after the people had grumbled and complained. And again, God sends the venomous snakes among them and they're killing the people. And he tells Moses to make a bronze serpent on a pole and lift it up. Whoever looks at the serpent uh, will be saved. But he had to lift up the pole. And so Jesus will be lifted up between heaven and earth. And whoever looks at him in faith will have eternal life. And here's that great verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Let's read all of this together. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is why Jesus came. He came because God loves the world. God loves the world. Even though God is angry with the world, God is angry with sin. He also loves the world. He also loves the people that sin. And he secured their salvation through sending his own son to die in their place. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Verse 18 is a crucial verse. Status quo sends you to hell. If you do not trust in Christ, you will go to hell. If, if, if you don't change anything from the moment you're born, spiritually, you will go to hell. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. This harkens back to John chapter 1. And people who love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Just look at the current news cycle to see an example of that. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Uh, by the way, this is, this is one of the reasons where the church, listen to me now, church people, listen to me. The church should be a place where if someone is caught doing wrong, we should not shame them. They may feel ashamed because they did wrong, but that shame should not come from us. We should... Uh, now, if, if they're unrepentant, that's different. But if someone is caught in a sin, if someone is, you know, does something and it's abundantly clear that they've been making unwise choices, we should extend forgiveness to them. We should extend grace to them. Why? Because the church should be a reflection of God, a place of light, where when wicked deeds are exposed... They are then purged and cleansed and made right with God. There's a reason that people run from the light, and it's so that they won't be exposed. And uh, so the the church, even though I don't expect wicked, you know, I don't expect unsaved people to come to church um, with their, you know, admitting what they've done wrong, but the church should be a place of forgiveness and reconciliation. And too often, it's not. It's a place of judgment and gossip and that too is a sin that we need to repent of. Verse 22. Uh, by the way, yeah, verse 22. And this, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the, into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. So Jesus himself did some baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem, because their water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew 
over purification. Here he's talking about the ritual purification of the types where they would simply pour some water on the hands, rub them a little bit, let it drip down to the elbows, uh, ritual purification of pots and pans and things like that. After, and, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. James 1.17 Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Oh man, what a, what a stark contrast between the Pharisees and John the Baptist, between the religious leaders and John the Baptist. They saw, the religious leaders saw John the Baptist, I'm sorry, saw Jesus and his ministry increasing and they felt threatened because they did not know their place and they did not know his place. John the Baptist understood what his role was. And when he saw Jesus' ministry increasing, he understood, it's time for me to fade into the background. I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. That's a hearkening back to Matthew 28, 18. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given unto me. Verse 36 is so important. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. The wrath of God remains on him. I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. Number one is that believing is the opposite of disobedience. Disobeying, you know, how do we, what is the worst way that we can disobey the Son? By not believing in Him. Uh, this point is driven home very strongly in the book of Hebrews, where unbelief and disobedience are linked together over and over again. And belief and obedience are linked together over and over again. The first act of obedience an unsaved person can make to God is not going to church, is not beginning to read the Bible, is not praying. It is believing in the Son. It is believing that Jesus, the God-made flesh, has died for them. That is the, the first and only act of obedience that matters for an unsaved person. And when they do that, they have eternal life. Whoever does not do that, whoever does not obey, will never see life. But look at this. The wrath of God remains on him. Earlier, he said, you don't have to do anything uh, to be condemned. This is what he means. When you, before you're saved, the wrath of God remains on you. This is why, friends, it's important to tell people about Christ because they are under the wrath of God and they will fall under the wrath of God unless they obey, unless they believe in the Son. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I hope you can join me tonight at uh, Bible study. And if you can't find me um, in person uh, at the church, if you can't be there in person, look for the video upload sometime tonight or in the morning where I will upload uh, tonight's teaching from church. It'll be Mark chapter 9. God bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.